Hi everyone and welcome to this very exciting digital author talk. My name is Min and I'm the digital producer here for the kids and families team at the Sydney Opera House. The land that the Sydney Opera House sits on is now called Benelong Point, but the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, called this land Tubagali, and I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present. Today's author talk is slightly different. We have our author connecting to us via Calandra in Queensland. And our author today is Jessica Townsend. She has written the Nevermore series, which includes three books, Nevermore, Wonder Smith, and her latest Holopox, which just recently came out. And I can't wait to read the next one in the series. Can we please put our hands together and summon a little wonder and welcome Jessica Townsend. Hi, Jess. Hello. It's Hi. so nice. How are you doing? Oh, it's so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. So for those of you... Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great. For those of you who didn't see our talk that we did with Jessica in 2018, you can head to the Sydney Opera House website and watch that talk as well. But today we're going to delve a little bit more into the life of Morrigan Crow and the, all of her friends at the Wondrous Society and learn a little bit more about Jessica's writing process and what's been happening in the last couple of years. So is everyone ready? Jess, you ready? I'm so ready. Okay. Ready as have, I will ever be. Let's go with our <laughs> first question. Now, you're now up to book number three. How much mm -hmm. of the writing process for you has changed since writing book number one to now completing book number three and on to book number four? All, all three of them have kind of been completely different beasts. Nevermore was really just its own experience. It was written over a really long period of time. I took about 10 years to write it. I obviously didn't have a deadline. <laughs> I didn't have an editor. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have any readers. It was really just me. Um, and so I was, I could just take as long as I wanted and needed to kind of let it incubate and, and get it right. Book two, I mean, the, the saying goes, you have your entire life to write your first book and then six months to write your second. Um, I did take a bit longer than six months, uh, but it was just wild how, how different that experience was and um, kind of quite stressful, I guess, because, you know, you sort of feel like you've got people suddenly sitting in the room with you in a way. It's, you know, you've got readers sitting on your shoulders and editors and it's, it was quite a psychological um, thing, but um, book three, I feel like I had more of a handle on the process, and um, I knew I had a much better idea of what I could reasonably achieve in a day. So, like a, a word count that I could complete, which I would be happy with, and not feel like I would have to throw the whole thing out, you know, at, at the next day. Um, but you know, there are always little surprises, and I'm sure that book four will again be completely different. <laughs> yeah. I remember from the last time when we spoke to you that you're a very organised person. Can you tell us a little bit about, I know you were saying you had a, a word count, what that process <laughs> is for you? That What is the process for writing a book? Well, I guess f from a kind of taking a step back and looking at the whole thing, there is a period of of planning. Obviously, I've done a lot of planning for the entire series. So for each book, there is an amount of that work that's already done for me by past Jess. Thank you, past Jess. Um, but then when I sit down to write the next book, there is a period of just thinking. So like really a big important part of the process is just thinking, daydreaming, thinking it through in my head, having conversations with myself, thinking it through on the page, um, taking lots and lots of notes and making bullet point lists of the things that I think should happen, the things that need to happen, um, fun moments that I would like to put in or that I've been waiting, people I've been waiting to introduce. Um, and then also, and this is increasingly as the series goes on, a list of things that have to be resolved in this particular book or have to be moved forward in some way in this particular book. So there's all of that thing, all of that that's done it up front. Having said that, you can only plan so much. And so I'll, at some point you kind of just need to jump in and do it. The writing process day to day for me looks like um, just sitting in front of my computer for sometimes hours and hours and hours on end trying to eke out every single word that day. And sometimes it looks like just smashing out a thousand words. So I try to aim for about a thousand words in a day. 
it's different for every writer. I know people who can write three or four or 5,000 words a day and be happy with it. Or, um, you know, some people might only write two or 300 words, but for me, a thousand is where I sit comfortably and, 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 you know, can feel like I've, I've done a good day's work. So that's sort of how that work, that looks for me. <laughs> and do you do you feel sometimes that you start off thinking that it's going to... Has it ever happened that you go off one direction and then halfway through writing the book you're like, oh, no, actually, I've got to, this has got to change. I've got to take it in this direction in order for the next book. Yeah, absolutely, all the time. I mean, I because I have that overarching plan for the whole series... Um, it's never like a drastic thing. Like usually the entire plot for the book isn't necessarily going to change or it hasn't so far. But there are things that surprise me. Like there are sometimes I'm like, for example, there's a character in this book called Rook and I won't say who Rook is because I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it, but Rook was a real surprise and I really didn't know that she existed until she literally introduced herself on the page and then I thought, oh, of course, of course she's a person. Um, And that kind of changed, that brought in a, a whole different element that you know, I then needed to sort of play out. Um, I think that you kind of have to leave room to surprise yourself. As much as I really love to plan and love to plot, um, if I can't surprise myself in some way, then I'm never going to be able to surprise my readers. So I try to maintain a certain amount of flexibility so that if some fresh new idea comes in, I can uh, pivot, <laughs> which, as we were discussing earlier, is the word of 2020. I can pivot slightly um, into into some new uh, sort of part of the story, but it it's um, as as the story goes on and there are sort of more, like my early sort of three to five or six books are quite heavily plotted and then some of that in the last three books is a little bit sparser because I'm assuming that things are going to happen in these books that will make me have to remain flexible and change things as I go along. And do you find that these characters that you're creating live with you all the time? Yeah, it's annoying. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's one of those things when I'm in the writing of a book, so I feel like I live in two very different headspaces. I live in this headspace, which is the book is done, it's out in the world, it's not just in my head anymore, it's in the reader's heads, and now I, I talk about it. Now my job is to, is to have fun conversations like this one, which is a really nice perk of the job. Um, and that's a completely different headspace to the writing headspace, which is really just almost total immersion in, in the world. And I am someone who does tend to... I'm either really struggling to focus or I'm hyper-focused on one thing. Um, and when I'm writing the book... It's, it's not just the physical act of sitting down and writing and being at a screen. It's all of the in-between times. It's when I'm off doing other things, talking to my family, going on walks, cooking, whatever I'm doing. It's always kind of burning away in the background, and which is a really useful thing because, you know, our brains do a lot of untangling through our problems for us, I think, when we're not thinking about them. And as a writer, that's quite a useful thing to have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, I also remember from the last time when you spoke to us, you talked about how important it is for us to be reading in this, you know, and absorbing lots of different things. Now, there's obviously been a really big shift this year into sort of more of a digital um, era with us connecting a lot um, during this time through Zoom and things like that and watching programs on TV and all that sort of stuff. How, how, more, how important is that even more so now for us to be reading and absorbing stories through that means? I mean, absolutely. And and look, when I sort of talk to my friends and, and kids that I know, and I, the, the, I think that I have seen definitely like more um, digital content being consumed. But I think equally there has been a surge in people reading. And a lot of booksellers that I've spoken to have said that they are thriving, and which is so lucky because in the beginning of all of this, all of this being 2020, in the beginning, um, you know, people in the book community were, were really worried. I was worried for, for booksellers, particular, particularly independent booksellers, that, you know, how would they make it through this? And I think the good thing is, is that we are all so hungry for stories right now. We're all so hungry to get outside ourselves and our own experience and to occupy our time and occupy our minds. Um, and we are finding that digitally through streaming services and, and online content. But also I think people are sort of turning to, to to books more and more, which is great. It's really 
really encouraging. Um, I am slightly hypocritical because I do talk so much about the importance of reading, but I've got to tell you, I've the last couple of years, I've had the worst reading years of my life. I've been in a little bit of a slump and I'm definitely not reading as much as I should. This year has, um, just recently I've read a couple, I've been very lucky, I've read a couple of books from new middle grade authors that aren't even out in the world, they're coming out next year that I'm really excited about. So that's kind of sparked my my love of reading a, a little bit more. But it's been strange, I think, because I've been writing. Every time I sort of sit down to read a book in the last couple of years, I've just felt this immense guilt of I, I've got to be working like why am I reading I have to be writing my own book so it's switching off that part of my brain and getting back to just the love of engaging with someone else's story that I think has been nice <laughs> yeah yeah and the, the pleasure of reading and enjoying other people's stories while still Absolutely. creating your own and sharing them together yeah. yeah exactly and people are you know really sharing their um their their love of books and sharing their book recommendations and it has become, you know, as much as it's very much an internal thing, it has become this very communal thing, I think, in the last few months, which has been really nice to see. Mm. So back to writing and your and your process through that, how do you deal with writer's block when you can't write, when you don't have the stories? What are some things that really get you yeah. um, through that? Well, it's a weird thing because I don't, I'm, I'm slightly stubborn in the fact that I in the traditional sense of how what we understand writer's block to be or, you know, which is people talk about it as this sort of external force, I think, where, you know, writer's block is a thing that's being done to me or it's a thing that I is, is happening to me. And I, I don't necessarily think that writer's block exists in that sense um, in the same way that I don't think that we have we have to wait for divine inspiration or wait for our muse to come along to write. But... Obviously, the experience, the feeling of being blocked and, and having writer's block is 100% a real thing. I, I get it all the time. Or I think every writer I know has experienced that. Um, the thing that is sort of useful for me is uh, that, that I find sort of most useful in that situation is to... As, as I said, not think of it as an external thing, but think of it as a problem that I can interrogate. I can ask questions about this. Because more often than not, it is a thing, it is a thing that you can solve. It's either I've, something has happened in this story that I am not considering right now. Perhaps a couple of chapters ago, I took a wrong turn. And now I feel like I've written myself into a corner and maybe I need to go backwards and untangle that before I can move forwards. Or maybe there's a character who doesn't belong here. There's a character who's unnecessary or, you know, whatever that it might be in the story. Um, or maybe it's a, like a more sort of physical thing. Maybe it's I'm just tired. That day. Maybe I'm hungry. Maybe I didn't eat breakfast. Um, you know, maybe I'm distracted by an argument that I had with my sister yesterday, whatever it is. Like, I think that the most useful thing to do for writer's block is to interrogate it, ask the questions, what exactly is this? Is this a problem I can solve? And in a lot of cases, the, the solution is just walk away, stop writing, just have a walk, have a bath, what, read someone else's book, watch a movie, go and pat your dog, whatever it is. Um, I often, more often than not, I find the solution is to get out of my own head. And then, as I said, let some of that problem solving happen in the background. And then when I come back to the page, maybe I will feel a bit better and feel a little bit unblocked. It's really nice to hear you talking about a creative process like writing involving things like problem solving and critical thinking, because these are, you know, really massive lifelong um, tools that I think it's really important for us to all gain um, and that you're using those when, when you're writing a new story. Absolutely. I mean, that's sort of the whole thing of, of being a writer and, and that's, the, that's, that's at the heart of writing because that's at the heart of plot is having some kind of problem, some kind of question that you need to answer and and yeah, obviously that then is reflected in the actual act of writing is that we need to be able to think critically, not just about our story and not just about the world around us and how we're interpreting it, but also about, you know, what is it that I'm experiencing right now? What am I feeling and how can I fix it? Mm. So where do you get inspiration from? What authors, um, writers, poets do you get inspiration from? I honestly think it comes from everywhere. I think that we probably draw inspiration from every every writer, every, <clears throat> every book that we read, every movie and film and every piece of art that we absorb. Um, when I try to think of specific ones that have influenced me, I would say um, 
The one that most often comes to mind for me is John Marsden because he was so much part of my formative years as a writer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, I think like most Australians my age, we we grew up and, and you know, I'm sure you probably grew up reading John Marsden and, um, you know, he's, he's such a kind of an important part of the literary landscape in Australia. And I think that... You know, people who re, who read Nevermore and then would read Tomorrow When the War Began may not necessarily see the influence, but I see it and I feel it because and I think mostly the influence is um, kind of in the, you know, he's such a human writer. He brings so much humanity to his characters and he really tries to make them feel like fully fleshed out people with stories of their own and and feelings and, um, you know, and that's something that I try to bring to my characters as well. And also just in his sense of humour, I think that he obviously has a very Australian sense of humour. I think that as as British as Nevermore feels, as, as much as it has a very British sensibility, I think it has a very Australian sense of humour. And um, that is something that I always really loved about his books and, and just his ability to, um, you know, he's he wrote, in particularly in that series, but in a lot of his books, he wrote about quite dark things, quite serious things. Um, but it was always underpinned with these moments of levity and, and moments of lightness. And um, I think that's that's the thing that readers love about those books. And, and that's something that I think I tried to bring to, to my own books. Mm, let's um, talk a little bit more now about Nevermore and about the characters and themes in the books. So you, you're now published in over 20 countries, which is amazing. Your books have been published all around the world. What do you think it is about the universal appeal of this story? It's, it's such a tricky question for me to answer because I think I'm so close to it that I struggle to have that distance that lets me really see what it is because it's so sort of personal to me. I think if I talked about it from a purely mechanical story point of view, I, what I would say is that I've quite deliberately... Um, made the details of it feel universal. So you couldn't pin this to one particular time or place. And that, I think, lends itself to translation because, you know, Polish readers or Russian readers or Thai or Vietnamese readers can all sort of experience those those characters and those places um, in the same way that anyone else could. Um, but I think, like, at the if we're talking about kind of the heart of the story and, and what people respond to in that way, I think it is definitely comes down to the characters and particularly Morrigan, because we're seeing everything from her point of view. Um, I, if I had to hazard a guess, and it is pure speculation, because as I said, I think I'm too close to really answer it, but I think it's because Morrigan herself is such... She is not a perfect person. She is not a chosen one who is brimming with confidence and always knows what to do. And, uh, you know, she's someone who worries about things she is a f she she doesn't always make the right decision but she tries to and she worries about what the right decision might be and she struggles to know who to trust and sometimes she doesn't always know whether she can trust herself um but you know despite her background and despite the things that she's gone through she is an optimistic person she is she's coming at the world from a place of hope because she's looking for somewhere to belong. Like she has never felt like she belonged, but she comes into this brand new overwhelming situation believing that, you know, despite the all of the evidence to the contrary, maybe I do belong here and maybe, you know, maybe this this new family is is the family for me. And, and I think that's something that people are, everyone's kind of just looking for somewhere that they belong, aren't they? Mm, absolutely. Um, you have described your writing as a juxta juxtaposition between the silly and the sinister. How do the do you think these two writing styles blend together to create your your own unique style of storytelling? Well, I think those two things kind of feed into each other very neatly. Um, and I think they really, in, particularly in this story, they really rely on each other because if I was writing this particular story as just scary, just scary, just dark, just sinister, it, it wouldn't work. On the flip side, if I was writing it as just silly all the time and it's all fantastical details and it's all the magic and the... Um, and the spectacle, that also wouldn't work. It's really feeding these moments in, plaiting them in together. Um, and a practical example of that would be, um, for example, like when Morrigan first comes to Nevermore and 
Um, she and Jupiter are going through border control. Spoilers for anyone who still hasn't read Nevermore. This is a few a few chapters in, but um, <laughs> she they come to border control and it's quite scary because she's being snuck into this secret city and there's, you know, there's mist all around and she's being interrogated by this disembodied, booming voice uh, who's demanding to see her papers and know where she's from and there's a big mechanical eye that's looking into their vehicle and it's terrifying. Um, and then it's undercut immediately by the fact that we realise, oh, Jupiter actually knows that disembodied voice. It's a mate of his. It's his friend Phil. And Phil says, come around for dinner next week. And Jupiter's, you know, holding up a used tissue and a chocolate wrapper as her official papers. And so it's kind of moments like that that are deliberately crafted to manoeuvre the plot so that it can move forward and also to kind of manipulate, I guess, for want of a better word, the reader's response to the story as it goes along because I want you to feel like, oh, this is a, t a scary thing that's happening, but then have that reaction of, of, oh, it's a sigh of relief and vice versa. You know, I want in those, in, there are so many moments of kind of banter and lightness where you think it's something very silly is happening and then suddenly an, a scary moment arrives and it's a plot twist and I want you to feel that like, oh, you know, so <laughs> it's all about manipulation. So <laughs> in Hollow Pox, Morrigan really starts to become her own um, as part of um, a wondersmith and also to, to learn the wondrous arts. Uh, Jess is so great. She's going to read a little bit of um, the new book, Hollow Pox, to us, all about... Should we go yes. to the place where we go called Gossamer Spun Garden and check a little bit of that passage out, Jess? Let's do it. One of my favourite spots. <laughs> Straight from the author herself. Right. This is an excerpt from Hollow Pox. <laughs> We're going to start with the same task assigned to every wondersmith who has ever entered this garden, explained Brilliance. You will find it incredibly simple to do, yet monstrously difficult to do well, and just about impossible to do perfectly. But that's what the Gossamer Spun Garden is for. Mistakes, failures, practice. So let's get started. Please begin by calling Wonder. Morrigan followed along with Brilliance Amadeo's instructions and, to her delight, found she could do everything the other children could. Brilliance was a wonderful teacher, patient and precise, always willing to slow down or repeat herself if needed. Weaving is about expanding and contracting one's imagination, weaving together thought, creativity and physical matter to manipulate and create our own reality and bring our vision to life. When we weave, we pull threads from the gossamer and rearrange them, either to influence the world as it is, she paused for a demonstration and sent an enormous vine swinging back and forth in the distance with a casual flick of her wrist, or to make the world anew. When Morrigan narrowed her eyes, she could just make out the near invisible golden white threads of wonder working in the background, darting to and fro to obey their unspoken orders. She soon discovered that she needn't properly sing to call wonder. It was paying closer attention to her, like a dog alert to its owner's every command. In this kind of constant communication, she only had to hum a few notes to feel it gathering to her fingertips. Just like Ezra Squall, she thought. The realisation came with a strange mix of alarm and satisfaction. By the end of the lesson, the students, Morrigan included, had each created their own clumsy sort of pseudo-flower, wonky and imprecise as they were. In her little patch of garden bed, Morrigan had created, uh, sorry, had tried to make a red rose and instead ended up with something more closely resembling a vomit green pillbox hat on a stick. Nevertheless, it was her vomit green pillbox hat on a stick. Morrigan felt elated. I made that, she kept thinking, while she sat on the ground staring at it. She felt powerful and brilliant and artistic, just like Brilliance Armadeo herself. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much for reading that. <laughs> I love the idea Especially of having a place where mistakes and failures and practice can happen. How important do you think that concept is when you're working in a creative field? Oh, it's so important. It's so much part of the process. Um, you know, we're not... The creative arts, they're not a sport. Like, there are no gold medals or world records or best times. <laughs> you know, it's 
it's it's all about kind of creating something that you love and something that you're proud of. And I mean, we know that to get better at any skill, creative or otherwise, we all accept that you have to practice. Well, a natural consequence of practicing is that there will be failure and there will be mistakes. Um, and so, you know, if we... It's, and it's also, it's not just about accepting that. It's not just like oh, well, this is just, you know, it's a bit of a bummer, but mistakes were, are made and they're a vital part of the process. They're not a bug, they're a feature. It's, it's an important and vital part of the process. It's, a, it's something to celebrate. When you are coming up with your, say, for, take writing just as one creative field. If you, as you are become, as you're learning how to write and you're coming up with a voice and coming up with a character and, and writing your own book or story or whatever it might be, Every misstep, every little blunder that you make or everything that feels like a blunder or a mistake is one step closer to getting you to the place that you actually want to be. The process of writing a book is, it's, it's founded entirely on making, mis making mistakes and failing because that is what the process is. Like, I think that when I was younger, and I think a lot of young readers in particular think that the thing you put down on the page has to be perfect. We're all sort of inflicted or afflicted, I should say, with this like, you know, uh, some degree of perfectionism of thinking that, you know, that we have to, that we have to do it right the first time and that it has to be perfect. But actually I am so delighted when I get to a point in my story and I realize, oh, I've taken a wrong turn here or this chapter sucks or whatever, you know, whatever it is that's gone wrong. In the moment, it feels horrible. Like, I'm not saying that we should all be like, cheers to that, what a great day it's been. But <laughs> in, the more, in the moment, it feels terrible. But then later on, that's getting you one step closer to the thing that does work. It's getting you one step closer to being a better writer, to create, to finding your voice as a writer um, or whatever, it, whatever your field may be. So, yeah, it, as I said, it's not just, um, it's not just a bummer. It's, they're not just, mistakes aren't just hurdles. They're, um, they're, they're definitely a, a feature. <laughs> Get to learn from them and grow from them, yeah. Now, 100%. Morrigan gets to spend some time in some cool, pretty cool places in the book. She obviously spends some time in the Goblin Library and the Home Train and then the Hotel de Coulian, um, and the Gossamer Spun Garden, which you've just read from. If you could spend some time in any of those places, which place would you choose? <sighs> That is so hard to, yeah, I don't know. I have, I definitely, I would say that I have a top three. My top three would be like, especially if it's one location at one particular day, it would be uh, Courage Square on Christmas Eve for the Battle of Christmas Eve between St. Nicholas and the Yule Queen or um, the or all pretty much all of Old Town during summer on a Friday night when the Nevermore Bazaar is on. Um, I would love to experience, I love markets and festivals and stuff like that so th I think that would be the ultimate market would be the Nevermore Bazaar or just the hotel the hotel GK Leon at any time <laughs> any time any day <laughs> I think you could find something ridiculous and fun if I absolutely had to pick one I think it would have to be the hotel GK Leon for sure <laughs> yeah I think I'd want to I'd want an invitation <laughs> there too Jess <laughs> yeah we can just go and let's go we'll hang out in the smoking parlor it'll be great be right? amazing <laughs> do you have a process for coming up with these really unique locations that you have in your books? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say a process. Like I'd, I'd hesitate to say that there's kind of any particular formula or strategy to it. I think that a useful tool to have would be like a curiosity about the world, about the real world, because, you know, as much as we, we talk about sort of creating unique original places, like nothing's particularly unique. It's just things that have been sort of inspired by things that already exist mostly in the real world and twisted slightly or, um, you know, um, changed in some way to, to make it a bit more exciting and interesting. I think that that's the most useful starting point is being curious about our own world and and you don't have to go off travelling, you know, you don't have to actually see these things for yourself. Like we're living in a golden age of information, you know, you can you can find this information out there. You can go to the library, you can go to the internet and you can learn so much about the most bizarre and interesting and beautiful places and draw inspiration from there. You know, the Nevermore Bazaar um, was definitely inspired by the markets in Marrakesh that I really loved. And a lot of Nevermore is inspired by um, things in, in London. Um, you know, and there's a there's a part uh, there's a, a location in book four coming up. I'm not going to spoil too much, but um, it's 
very much inspired by by Venice. There's a neighbourhood in in Nevermore that um, is a little little nod to Venice. So that's that's a good starting point, I think. So let's move a little bit more into the characters. All of the the Nevermore series has a really fantastic ensemble of interesting characters. What do you think this adds to the process of the reading your books for the um, for the reader? Yeah, there, there's just a, a huge amount of characters in these books that just then that's growing with every book. I think um, I think it's useful because it means that that among this ensemble there is someone for everyone there is a character that everyone can sort of identify with in some way whether it's some kind of personality trait or some part of their background or whatever it is um and yeah I I think that everyone can sort of find the person that they love or that they love to hate or that just tickles their funny bone a little bit um and it's also frankly it's just it's just fun for me. It's the thing that I enjoy the most. I enjoy coming up with people and naming them. And it's probably going to be a problem at some point because it's going to just, if it hasn't already, just blown out and become <laughs> slightly unwieldy <laughs> the size of the cast. I think I'm managing it. Is there a character <laughs> that you most identify with that you've written? Um... Well, I think that I kind of have to identify with most... I would not say all of them because some of them are just horrible people. Um, But I think I have to identify with something in most of my characters. Um, But by necessity, I also have to identify with Morrigan the most because we're seeing everything from her point of view. And so the things that... not, Not necessarily like her personality or her background or anything that's happened to her in her life, but her feelings about things are naturally my feelings about things because I'm imagining, you know, when something scary or or confronting or whatever it is happens, I'm I'm imagining how I would feel in that situation and I'm giving Morrigan that experience. Um, You know, her experience of coming to Nevermore was similar to, well, felt like my experience of coming to London in my early 20s and, you know, little things like that. Um, yeah, I think there's there's definitely a lot of me in the way that Morrigan reacts to things and feels about things. But I also, if I had to pick a side character, I would say it would be Hawthorne because Hawthorne, like me, has kind of just obnoxious amounts of enthusiasm for silly things. <laughs> Now, listen, there were parts of this book that really seem similar to what 2020 has been for for us Um, and what we've lived through with our quarantine and obviously um, something going around and doing things to people. Just say that. I, can't, I don't want to give anything away, Jess. Some, this is something. really hard. Um, how much of That's this okay. Book... That's in the blurb. It's all okay. right. Okay, great. Um, so, I mean, obviously you've said it takes about a year to write this book. So clearly you started writing this book before um, what this year has been mm. and with, with COVID has come out. I mean, so much of art sometimes imitates life. Were you watching what was happening going, oh, my gosh, my book kind of mirrors this a little? Yeah, it's such a strange thing. Um, I So the way that publishing works, um, books are generally planned and written well in advance of their publication dates, as you know. Um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand that. They think that you finish writing the book in July and then it's published in August. Um, but no, this, this book was... I, I mean, I took so many years to write Nevermore, but a lot of that was plotting the entire series. And so Hollowpox, which was for many years called nothing pox um but I changed the name when I started writing it because nothing pox once I started actually saying it out loud I found that it does not trip off the tongue so it was changed to hollow pox which I think is a a lot nicer um (laughs) but yeah it was sort of plotted and and for years before um and then most of it was actually written last year I handed in the first draft midway through last year went into edits did many months of editing back and forth there were. I was still in the last of the editing process when COVID began, but most of that was kind of the last few chapters and it was much more about sort of Morrigan's journey as a wondersmith than the actual Hollowpox stuff. It was really weird, um, especially in the, big, in the beginning. I mean, it's, it still feels, obviously, we all still feel very uncertain about things, but you, you will remember and everyone watching this will remember back in March when everything felt so uncertain because it was so fresh and 
you know, borders were closing everywhere and I was overseas at the time I was in London and, and so was my sister and nephew and niece and, you know, we were kind of struggling with the real world impact of it, of making the decision of like, do we stay and ride this out? Should we go home to where the rest of our family is? So there was all of that going on and also there was the question of, for me anyway, of like, is this insensitive? Do I even publish this? Am I going, I genuinely had a, a period where I thought I'm going to have to write a new book and I'm just going to have to be okay with that and we'll, we'll move forward because I thought it's too close. I'd never want to be insensitive. I never want to say anything that's going to be hurtful to anyone. And at that point it was like, what's going to happen here? Like, what's the experience going to be? Am I going to have written something in here that comes too close or whatever? And um, I think my editor was really reassuring at the time and, and, and you know, she said, it's, it's fine. Like, it's a completely different thing. It's, it's dealt with pretty sensitively and, and there are some weird kind of specifics that are spooky parallels, but at the end of the day, it is, it is a very different situation. But, yeah, it's, it's very strange and I don't really know what else to say about it. I hope, my hope is that, um, is that it's just a nice escape. Um, and... And it's very kind of gratifying to have had that response, particularly from a lot of parents, I think, who are sharing the book with their kids. They're saying, you know, I have had some people tell me this is helping us have a conversation about about it. It's helping us stand back and reflect on our own situation a little bit and, and analyse it with that little bit of emotional distance because it's so hard for us to really grasp what's going on as we're living it. Um, so, and, and, you know, that's nice, but ultimately I, I just hope that it's kind of a cosy little escape from, from 2020. <laughs> I think one of the other things that came up for me reading the book as well is that all of the residents of Nevermore deal with some other really big themes, and that is to do with um, the woo animals, woo woo animals, um, dealing, animals? <laughs> dealing, being treated differently because they look different and are different to mm. what is supposedly normal. Um, and then also Fenn's comment, and she says, we don't ignore bigotry. That's how cowardly bigots turn into brave bigots. Um, and those big themes, you know, being able to put those into books and, and amongst a story that's quite magical... Um, must must make you sort of really um, think about how you're delivering those those ideas out to young people. Um, yeah, I think that obviously it's those kinds of themes and and that story has it's always been relevant. Like, unfortunately, there's no shortage of prejudice in the world. There's no shortage of us of examples in the real world for us to to look to um, as an analogy for, you know, or for animals as an analogy for real life. But um, I think that um, I had a thought in my head and it's literally just I looked out the window and it escaped my brain. Um, do, you think it's about, <laughs> so do you think it's about creating a safe space, like a fictional space where those, those themes and concepts can be explored? I mean, that's kind of what fantasy fiction in particular has always been about and has always been good at. It is not just about the spectacle and the fantastical. It is about looking at ourselves. It's about creating a world that reflects the world that we know and using that to kind of contextualise it and ask questions about who we are and who we want to be and, and showing, you know, examples of the way that people can behave and the things that they believe and the way that they treat other people. And, you know, and I suppose that there are, w without sort of ever intending to have done it, in this book there are very clear examples of the way that people have failed, I think, in real life in regards to, the you know, what we're experiencing with COVID at the moment, but then also in the bigger picture of, um, you know, how we're dealing with bigotry in the world and, and how we're taking a stand against it and how we're protecting people and how we show up as allies for other people. And, you know, that is, that is something that I think is the most important thing to do in, in all fiction, but in particularly in fantasy, because, you know, it is not just about the spectacular, it is about the, you know, reflecting, like showing ourselves and, and, you know, questioning ourselves and interrogating who we are and what we're about and what we want to be. Um, I feel like I went in a slight circle in that answer because it's it's 
it's a thing that I think about a lot, but find sort of difficult to articulate, I guess, in a way. Um, but I think that children's books in particular have a really important job to do. And I don't ever want to feel like I'm being, I don't want ever want the reader to feel like I am being didactic, but I am telling a story that is at, at its heart about us. Like it's about these, these people in Nevermore, it's about that city, but I'm talking about the world that we live in because that's the interesting stuff to me. Like it's the, the Gossamer Spun Garden and the Battle of Courage Square, you know, whatever else, that's all fun and interesting. But the thing that I find most interesting is finding ways to draw parallels to our world and and kind of see see how that plays out in a fantasy arena and have and give myself and give the reader hopefully that little bit of distance that they can look at it and they can see where they align themselves in that setting and, and who they um, who they feel that they identify with in terms of those characters and the way that people respond and the way that they um, behave towards others. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. No, no, that's great. When, I mean, you really seem to know what your audience wants from your books. How do you put yourself in their shoes when you're writing or coming up with the ideas? Um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't think that I do it with any sort of deliberate sense. I think it is re really just that I'm my best reader. You know, I'm my first reader. I'm, I, I know how to please me. I know how to make me want to read more um and that's kind of all I can do and I think for me that's the this is the wrong word but that's kind of the purest way to write this because if I'm thinking about what do all of my readers want how do I please everyone then I'm not going to please anyone and so if I think about you know what can I specifically do that makes me the first reader um want to continue in this story and gives me that sense of satisfaction at the end then you know, hopefully that then translates to a wider audience. And that's that's all you, I think that's what you really can do as a writer at the end of the day, because if you are trying to anticipate what people want to see in your book, then, you know, it is impossible to please everyone. You just have to tell the story that you want to tell. <laughs> I mean, um, this is just a really quick top tip. What is the best way that you draw inspiration <laughs> for your stories from the world that exists around you? Ooh. Uh, really quick top tip. As you've guessed, I'm not good at quick stuff, but I'll try. Um, so one, one weird tip, as they say on the internet, here's one weird tip. Um, a really good way is uh, go onto public transport and eavesdrop. <laughs> it's not, um, I, don't know, I don't know about the ethics of that, but, you know, people like to have loud conversations in public and sometimes they're really interesting. And I genuinely have picked up little weird bits of dialogue because people speak in their when they when they're just having a conversation with a mate even if it's in public they're speaking in their normal voices and and it's and it's kind of really useful to listen to the way that people speak and sometimes it sends you off on a little rabbit hole in your mind okay expanding on that story on that that answer for everyone that's watching today what would be your top tips for writing a story my top tips for writing a story. Look, I think that um, th there are things, there are important things that you can think about. I'm always hesitant to apply any kind of rules or strategies. I think that when people tell you these are the, <clears throat> this is the rules of writing a good story, this is what you absolutely need, always kind of look at that. My advice is to look at that with a little bit of side eye because I don't think that there are any rules and the best stories and the stories that stick with us the longest, sometimes they do break all of those rules. So take all of this with a grain of salt. However, things that I think for beginner writers in particular that are really useful to think about as you're sitting down to write, um, you know, obviously your voice or your point of view, the question that you're, that I ask first or that I ask first with this story is like, who is telling this story? For you, is that, um, is it one person? Is it many people? Are you telling it in first person or third person? Or I recently, oh, and also like past, present tense, future, whatever. I recently read a really interesting story. It's very uncommon to um, find a book, particularly books for children written in second person. So, like you blah 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 um this was written in second person present tense so for example you walk into the house and you see that your grandma has come to visit and you feel blah 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 that's really unusual 
And that just, I think that if that story had been written from a different point of view, it would have been a completely different story and I don't think it would have been as successful as it was because it has that intimacy and that urgency. So that's a really good thing to think about before you start writing is what's the voice here? Do I want a slightly more distant voice from the actual plot or do I want the reader to feel as if they are in the stomach of this story, they're living it and then it's this visceral thing where they feel that that intimacy and urgency? Um you know, obviously thinking about structure is, a, is an important thing. There are, I mean, I'm not going to go into kind of those sort of that level of detail and writing tips because that, fortunately, that's all available. You can you can Google about story structure and, and um, you know, creating a plot. And I, I'm sure that every teacher across Australia has amazing advice for that sort of thing. For me personally, I think a good story is something that takes you somewhere, something that makes you feel something. And so without wanting to ever be too prescriptive about you must have this and this and this, all I want when I pick up a book that I'm reading is I just want to feel something. I want to feel scared or I want to feel emotional or I want to feel as if I've just had a new experience or seen something new or looked through someone else's eyes. And and I think that the best way to do that and, and my advice for people, especially starting out in, in writing, is write for you. And that sort of goes back to what we were speaking about before. Like, don't second guess yourself and, and think about what anyone else wants to write. Don't think about what people are telling you, you know, that you should be writing about or that's a worthy thing to be writing about. Don't think about what publishers want to, to read or publishers want to publish. Like, think about what you would like to read and what you would like to see most in a book. Because, you know, that's, the best possible starting point and it will take you off in other directions but to me that's like the core of a good story is that I can tell when someone is writing the thing that they really just felt had to exist and I think that that is just a good that's a good vessel to carry you from the beginning of a story to its completion that's very vague advice I apologize (laughs) no that's great I think they're all fantastic ideas and tips um, <laughs> to, to extend, you know, not only in your writing that you do for school, but also any writing that you're doing at home as well. Um, Jess, as always, it's so great to talk to you and thank you so much for being very generous with all of your answers and your information that you've given us today about writing and also for reading a section of your new book, Holopox. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a joy and I've enjoyed every moment. (laughs) Fantastic. Teachers, if you head to the Sydney Opera House website, there are teacher resources there uh, about Holopox for you to download and to continue this learning journey in your classroom. A huge thank you to Hachette Book Publishers, to the New South Wales Premier's Reading Challenge and, of course, to Jess. Um, why not join us again another time for a tour or a talk or a workshop? Head to the Sydney Opera House Digital Education website page for all of those. And while you're there, connect with us on our Teachers Facebook and Educators page. Until next time, thanks so much for joining us. See you later.